Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Writer's Room Presents Wine and Reads. Today, we are honored with the presence of Dr. Becky Becker of Clemson State University. How are you doing, Dr. Becker? I'm doing well. It's just Clemson University. No I'm sorry. State. Yeah, it's just Clemson. Um, that's just, that was me. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> um, Dr. Becker is not only a professor at Clemson University, she's also the chair of the National Playwriting Program for Region 4 of the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. So just act accordingly for everybody watching, okay? Hot shots around here. It's um, fancier than it is. Oh, it's fancy. Don't let her downplay. It's fancy. Um, so essentially, uh, the writer's room, for anyone who hasn't been to one of our events before, it's a peer-to-peer -peer, um, art artist supporting artist community. We like to host these type of events, which are just events where you can get some information on how to write. We've had novelists. We've had screenwriters. We've had playwriters. We've had copywriters. Um, and we just want to support other people who are out there writing because writing can be a very lonely endeavor and we just want to give you all the tools and tips you need to get out there and do what you have to do so today our topic is playwriting we've had a lot of screenplays read so i was like you know what let's do something for the people who want to learn how to write a play and i couldn't think of no one else other than dr becky becker so without further ado i'm going to hand it over to dr becker thank you Durie. you're very welcome Wonderful to be here. I, I love what you're doing. Um, it's I think it's a, a great way for people to connect and a great way for people to let others see their writing in a safe space, a supportive space, which is super important because writing can be so personal. Mm -hmm. um, so what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about my approach to playwriting. And we're going to focus a little bit on traditional dramatic structure. Uh, and then we'll we'll talk about ways to get started and ways to sort of feed your work. Okay. Uh, before we go in, if anyone is watching and you have any questions about anything that's brought up, just comment. And if we see it in the comments, we'll answer the question live. Okay. All right. Um, you ready? Yeah. All right. Let's pull up the slide. All right, so you can go ahead and move right past this first one. That's just a little information about me. I decided to make a bit of an acrostic to get us started before I get into the nitty gritty of traditional dramatic structure, because I think there are ways to approach playwriting that can be really helpful. And I like the idea of playwriting being inspiration in action. Um, plays need action. And I, I always like to say that action doesn't necessarily mean just physical action, but that dialogue is also action. And one way that, that I have learned over time to really focus and um, create a play and create action in a play is by activating personal experiences. I think it's a really good place to start, especially for young playwrights. So, you know, if there's an experience that really impressed itself upon you, that might be a good place to start. Or a person, um, people that you know can be char become characters. Not that you want to necessarily recreate the exact person, but I know many, many people who are inspired by the people around them to create characters. So that's my, my first uh, A in action, my little acrostic there. Um, the next thing that I, I think about is to consider research. And Duri, I'm not just saying this because you don't like research. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that joke. Um, I, okay, I just let it, you can leave it sitting there. <laughs> I couldn't. Um, not that research necessarily has to be the focus of, of you know, your inspiration, but it can definitely be part of your inspiration. And of course, we, we need to be really careful with research because sometimes we might want to research and represent uh, a topic that really isn't ours to represent. Um, you know, so research can be an inspiration, but we need to make sure that whatever it is that we're, we're writing about is something that we have a road in that is not just purely connected through research. Uh, we need to also think about showing, not telling. And this is, 
this goes back to my days as an English major. I, I majored in English and theater as an undergrad, and I, I can't tell you the number of times in my creative writing classes that I was told to show and not tell. And so even when your play is really dialogue driven, you want to make sure that you're showing through the dialogue, not just telling what happened, but that it's actually happening in the moment. And that's gonna be much more engaging. The idea of inviting feedback is really important and it's scary, uh, as we were mentioning before. Sometimes it can be really scary to ask people to look at your work and give you feedback because if you're like me, when you write, you're putting a piece of yourself into it. And so it's almost as if when someone gives you feedback or a critique, that they're critiquing you. And of course, that's not the intention, at least not, not here and certainly not with most people. But feedback is hugely important because we can't really know how something lands on someone else or how it impacts them until they read it or hear it aloud and give us give us some response to us. Um, on rewriting, I, I just have to say it, it has to happen. Most playwrights will say that they, they continue rewriting their work and it never really stops. I mean, most, in fact, most writers say that nothing is ever really finished even though you might finish it and see a production that we're always rewriting in our head, in our heads as we see things happening. And then the last thing is it's so important for this process to be enjoyable. And it's not always going to be enjoyable, right? But if you're really excited about your, your writing, if you're really inspired by what you're writing, you're going to have a good time doing it. And, and you know, it needs to be that. Something else that I'm gonna mention if you really want to throw yourself into writing is to find some time every day to do some writing. It's really hard, it's a very disciplined activity, but that's one of the ways that eventually you will enjoy yourself because that process then it doesn't become uh, drudgery, it actually becomes something you look forward to. We can go on to the next slide. So traditional dra dramatic structure, I'm gonna be really straightforward. Um, traditional dramatic structure is not necessarily my favorite. <laughs> I, I appreciate it and, and you know, I do, I love, I love traditional structure, but I'm more drawn to non-traditional. However, we all need to understand and be able to execute traditional dramatic structure, I think, in order to really depart from that. Um, understanding the fundamentals of plot structure really helps us if we're going to move into a structure that's not familiar. And the other thing about traditional dramatic structure is that it's it's what we're most familiar with. Um, maybe we might be familiar with serial, uh, with a serial structure, which is kind of episodic. But even within that structure, most television that we watch, for example, has some kind of a climactic structure, which is traditional. So when we're looking at the fundamentals of plot, uh, I, I wanna just go through some terms because it, it doesn't hurt for budding playwrights to have some of those terms in their back pocket so that they can really be thinking about the way they're structuring their work. And so one of those terms is exposition. This is probably everyone's least favorite thing mm -hmm. as <laughs> exposition is all this really important information that you need to include because it's whatever happened before the first scene starts. And so that can be really uh, frustrating because you know there's kind of nothing, nothing worse than reading a play or a screenplay and the exposition is just sort of thrown out there and it sounds like exposition. One of the things you really wanna do with exposition uh, is put that essential information into the play in a way that makes it not sound like you're just putting, in the, putting it in there to make sure that the audience understands what happened before. And another thing to consider is when you're putting in exposition into your play, that it doesn't all have to happen in the first scene. In fact, it's more interesting if we learn a little bit at a time as the play continues, particularly in the first half, because then we're growing in our knowledge and that makes us a little bit more engaged as opposed to just putting it all out there at the beginning. The point of attack is uh, 
an interesting term to me because it implies that the story starts way before the play begins and it continues way after the play ends. So the point of attack is where in the story the playwright decides to begin the plot. And one of a really interesting way to, to choose to use the point of attack is to start really late. So instead of seeing all of the action that builds up to the climactic point, you might start your point of attack relatively late in the action so that you've got a really quick movement to the climax or to the, you know, the turning point in the plot. Um, is, is when you say, is that what you mean by, um, like, would that be more non-traditional to have your point of attack kind of in the middle of the action? Not necessarily. No, okay. um, you know, it, it, I guess, um, maybe if we're looking at really early realistic plays or traditional climactic structure, but even then, if you think about it, like for example, classic traditional play, A, A Doll's House by mm -hmm. Ibsen, the point of attack is pretty late, if you think about it. Um, you know, there's been all this action of Nora having signed some documents, uh, forged them, saved her husband's life by making money to uh, take him to a warm climate so that he could recover from his illness. But she's hidden all of this work that she's done and kept it from him. And we really come into the action just before she is revealed and before everything falls apart. Mm. So um, the point of attack is a really interesting way to, I, I guess, bring your audience into the action right in the middle of it. Right, right. I think more okay. people do it than we realize, actually. So we can move on. Uh, action is pretty obvious, really. But uh, the thing that I think I want to emphasize here is action is the central chain of events, but dialogue is also action. So one of the things that uh, I need to really work on when I'm teaching script analysis or playwriting or even theater history when we're talking about action in, in uh, plays is that a lot of times we think a little bit too literally that action is only physical, but so much action happens in the dialogue and, and not even just in an argument, but in the way that people engage uh, in sharing ideas and uh, speaking about the things that they're struggling with or whatever it is, that dialogue can be just as active as physical action. And it's important that it is because there are a lot of talky plays out there. And if, <laughs> if, we, didn't, if we didn't perceive them as action, uh, that would be really difficult to stage. Conflict, of course, is the struggle. Now, it's usually between the protagonist and the antagonist, which we'll talk about, and you've heard those terms before, I'm sure. But it's whatever that struggle is usually propels the action, moves it forward. And until we get to a turning point, a crisis, which is our next term, and then there's usually some kind of resolution, not always. Sometimes plays uh, don't resolve. That's actually not very traditional. Um, mm. Uh, you know, most traditional structure has some kind of a resolution, but, you know, not all. And, and that's, that's one of the things I want to really also emphasize is that within traditional structure, there are a lot of different structures. And that's true also of non-traditional structure. We, forms continue to change and grow and you know, over time, forms have really branched off in, in many different directions. But this climactic structure that we're talking about here is really kind of a, a touch point because I think all of us have some connection to it, at least in Western culture. Crisis, the turning point in the rising action. So usually there's a moment that we can point to where we can see that everything has been sort of moving to this point and then some event happens and the, the plot changes. It, it, it's the moment when everything sort of comes to a head and just twists to whatever direction the resolution is going to take. And that can also be, that can be early, but usually it's very late um, in, the, in the play's plot structure. 
I think that's good for this slide, unless you have a question, Doria. I didn't, but if I have one, I'll pop in. Okay. Uh, character. So I, I, I really like the way Aristotle talks about character, mostly because it helps us to think about the significance of characters and what we're doing with them. Because, of course, characters are patterned after human beings. And Aristotle says it when he says an imitation of a human being. Now, the thing that's a little uncomfortable about that is the idea of imitation, because, you know, what do you mean an imitation of a human being? But I think the most important thing about that is that a character has to have the same kind of complexity, the same kind of needs, desires, will, morals, humor. You know, it, there's there are layers to human beings, even though sometimes we don't acknowledge it. And I think uh, Aristotle is suggesting that when he says an imitation of a human being. So because though they are functions within the plot, we need to also think about the ways that they function. Mm. So characters sometimes further the plot. You know, um, a character might come in that we haven't seen and ask a question or provide new information that moves us forward. Usually, you know, it takes another character to, to do that. If you have a setup with, let's say, two or three characters, and then someone else comes in, and that usually pushes things forward. Sometimes characters are there mainly to reveal information about other characters. And it's really important to pay attention what characters say about one another. Not that it's always true. You know, we always have to take whatever each character is saying about another character and then think about it and watch those characters by their actions and decide whether or not the thing they've said is true. But that's really helpful when we're writing plays because it means that we can use characters to reveal information about each other, but also to add to the intrigue or to the conflict because of untrue things that might be said as well. Sometimes characters are largely there to add to the main idea or theme in the play. Um, a, a playwright who is really noted for this historically would be Moliere. Uh, in his plays, there was always a character called the raisonneur. <laughs> hmm. that, that character usually represented the playwright's point of view and was sort of the, the one who presented theme or the most important lesson we were, su were supposed to get from the play. Usually, you know, not stated directly, but sometimes stated kind of directly, even though uh, it's being, you know, shared with a diff another character in the play. In a sense, it's the playwright talking to the audience, telling us what they want us to think or feel. And then the last function is this idea of spectacle. Sometimes characters provide just laughter or joy or beauty or some other spectacle spectacular function and you know most most of the time characters do more than one of these things but every once in a while you might encounter a character that really is mostly doing one um, rather than anything else especially if you're looking at historical plays and and i think moliere is a really good example of characters that sort of fit within these different functions. Um, you spoke at the beginning about an imitation of a human being and um, the idea that the word imitations, because they're you know generally fictional, but the idea that they're human beings suggests complexity. Could you just give like some examples of um, ways to make a character complex or how to, how to, especially when you're using the functions here. So if I want comic relief, I want him to be funny, of course, but I also want him to be complex. How would I go about just sure. in, uh, an example? Well, uh, I'm gonna use a play that I directed last year and uh, by Kimberly Bellflower. Um, a playwright. I love her. I know. <laughs> and her play, John Proctor is the Villain, wonderful play. Please read it. It's, oh, it's just so fantastic. It's inspired by the Me Too movement. It takes place in a small Georgia town and in, in, in a high school. And there's a character in the play that 
is kind of a goofy jock and you could just see him as that and and kind of not very smart about women you know tries to say the right thing but says the wrong thing just kind of a dork but so he he provides some of the plays humor and spectacle because he says the wrong thing all the time however through the course of the play he begins to notice things and learn things <laughs> um, in class and in his conversations with the young women in the play because he joins their feminist club he needs extra credit and he joins mm. the feminist, feminism club and you see the wheels turning you see him growing and over time you know you think initially he's just going to be sort of this throwaway silly character but by the ending he's really grown a great deal because of uh, the way that he has listened and learned and maybe made big mistakes but then come back from those mm. you know he's he's this character is not a central character um he's really a supporting character but i i think that he's a good ex good example so one way to do that is yes give the character humor but then also put the character in situations where they can show a different side of themselves or learn or show empathy or grow or mm -hmm. even if i have a character um that is just too good mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and you need them to have a flaw yeah 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 i agree so, yeah so some of it is is just finding ways to show different sides of the character awesome all right Next. Fun. yeah all right, so as far as types of characters go, there are many types of characters. I, I included protagonist and, uh, protagonist and antagonist because they're sort of the central characters, typically in a traditional structure. The protagonist, central figure, hero, the person we're rooting for, typically. The antagonist is the person who opposes the protagonist, which is kind of interesting. They're defined in opposition to the protagonist. Uh, maybe uh, they're the person we're rooting against, the person who is causing the problem. Uh, the, the one thing that I would say about this is that sometimes you will run into plays where it might be really unclear who the protagonist and egg antagonist is. Um, do you have an example of that? Oh, of course you would ask me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Even if well, it's a movie. Well, actually, let me let me use a sitcom because okay. we all sort of know it. Mm -hmm. um, friends, you know. Okay. Um, there's no clear protagonist or antagonist there. I mean, they're all protagonists. Right. People come in and serve maybe the role of antagonist, but that whole group of people. Now, if we go to something like Seinfeld, there, there are some clear prota protagonist antagonists there. I can see that, yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I'm trying to think of a film. Well, I'm just thinking you were talking about friends. I mean, there's certain episodes where they're each other's protagonists yeah. and antagonists. Exactly. Exactly. But if you are someone who likes, you know, one of them, one of the, you know, if you like Chandler and Chandler's being a jerk, you might still see him as the protagonist. Right. Because he's your favorite character. Yeah. Or Joey. <laughs> yeah. 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 Or, you know, whoever. So I think that this can be a little bit limiting uh this idea of protagonist and antagonist however in traditional structure and historically it's it's really important um it's kind of a it's one of the basic aspects of structure that you're going to have someone who is on the right path and someone who is trying to stop them or something like that i i believe that forms and characters have become more complex. Um, I, I think that a lot of drama was written to show us um, a lesson, mm -hmm. perhaps, and that in doing that, it's really easy to kind of paint things in very stark 
contrasting colors. But I think the closer we got to modernism and of course now in contemporary culture, it's just so much more complex than that. There's so many grays uh, yeah. that protest to me, protagonist and antagonist doesn't really work very well anymore. Well, I mean, just to bring up an example, my favorite example of, of what you're talking about is um, Thanos. And because the idea that, you know, back in the day, it was just good guy, bad guy. And we still see him as the bad guy. But when you really look at, you could definitely define him as the protagonist. Like he has a clear goal yep. and the Avengers are just his obstacle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, it, it does blur the line. I think, I think the best antagonist could be protagonist if you just change the point of view. Well, and that's where we sort of think about the idea, I think, of the anti-hero, right? Mm, yeah. Um, and I think you, you're kind of describing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, yesterday, I came across a term and the term was tritagonist. And I've been doing plays since I was like 12 and I never heard that term before. So um, there's two terms. There's, I'm gonna say this right, deuteragonist and tritagonist. Do you mind explaining what those are? So these are Greek terms. And so the tritagonist would be the third most important. So if the protagonist is the first most important character and the antagonist is the second most important character, the tritagonist would be the third. And the deuteragonist, uh, deuteragonist yes. is, is the fourth and there's a tetragonist and, and I guess it continues. I okay. That's not terminology that I have ever taught. Right. Because I, I don't know. It just seems so technical and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It just gets into the weeds more than I think is necessary. But. Gotcha. Understood. Okay. Okay. We can move on if you want. All right, so in thinking about traditional dramatic structure or climactic structure, and there are many different ways that we we can uh, characterize this. Sometimes it's called linear structure. The idea is that, that the events are following a cause and effect uh, chronological movement from beginning to end. Usually that means that they're also following the logic of the unities that Aristotle wrote about. So the unity of time, place, and action. So we're not, uh, we, we don't have lots and lots of different locations. It doesn't usually take place over a long, long, long period of time. It's, it's maybe, maybe a day, you know, in, in Aristotle's day, um, he, they said a revolution of one revolution of the sun or something like that, which also meant that some of the plays, some of those ancient, ancient Greek dramas in particular 24 hours a lot happened mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> which is a little bit um unbelievable actually i suppose if you if you think about it but the important thing here is that this is a really familiar form for us because it's the idea that we start out with information about an event or events that have happened and there's pretty quickly a conflict that arises, and then there is action that moves us forward in a cause and effect fashion, and we get to a crisis point, things change in some way, and then we have some sort of a resolution to the end. And it's all done in a chronological way. Mm -hmm. And we can move on, because I think I've got a, a little... Um, drawing here. Freitag is uh, the, the person who uh, used this triangle and sort of named the, the different parts of the climactic structure. You know, he, he's really naming it after what Aristotle spoke about or wrote about actually mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Um, and all of this is laid out in the triangle, but pretty much everything that I just said is written on this, this diagram. Again, the diagram is great because it gives us a visual, but it doesn't really match all plots. You know, sometimes the triangle might have a much uh, longer, less steep rising action. Sometimes there might not be any resolution. Sometimes the resolution might be really long. It, it just really depends on the type of play and what the playwright's doing. 
I love this, by the way. This, I mean, because this is one of the first things you learn when you're learning to be to act at all. But like writing it, I think this actually works for playwriting, but I think it can work in a lot of instances for like any story that you're wanting to tell. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I don't really mean to diss dramatic structure because you know. <laughs> I don't think it's a diss. I just you're, you people that know you know you like outside of the box things. That's really what it is. I do. I do. Yeah. And and really, I I appreciate any structure done well. Yeah, of course. Things done well, I'm you know I'm gonna love it. Um, awesome. So okay. yeah, so I guess we can move on. So this is a really, this is a stock term for um, many, many, many other different structures, non-traditional dramatic structure. The one that I'm going to talk about and that I think applies to many different um, non-traditional structures is episodic. So this type of structure would be non-linear. Um, events are not necessarily moving in a cause and effect manner, which can mean that, you know, an event may be uh, a chronological series, but maybe one thing happens and then we have years that pass and something else happens, or we have random events that don't feel like they're connected, but by the end of the play, we understand why they're connected or mm -hmm. how they're connected. It's really about the exploration usually of an idea or a theme or uh, some other connecting point that doesn't necessarily uh, adhere to any of the unities. You know, there are it's, tons of different places, tons of different times. Um, it's interesting. I never thought about it till right now. Is is fences episodic? No. No. Why not? Because. Well, fences is is climactic. Okay. Because it's a pretty short time period. It's not, it's not as, t this is where it gets sticky mm -hmm. because fences has the basic traditional structure of a climactic play, but then it take, there's more time that passes right. and, you know, we have a character like, um, oh goodness, Troy's brother. Oh, Lions. The one he he's um mentally ill, right? It's not Lion. Is it Lions? Lions is the one who's mentally ill. He is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is he is is he no, the one that plays the trumpet at the end? Yeah. I didn't think his name was Lions. I'm, I'll look. I'll look. Go <laughs> ahead. Keep, keep going. I'm gonna look it up. <laughs> anyway, you're probably right. I'm probably just misremembering it. In any case, that's an unusual character also and the ending is very unusual right right for a climactic play and so this is again this is kind of where more and more contemporary work i feel mixes things you know it's not completely climactic structure it's got some episodic qualities but also i mean august wilson's plays kind of have their own structure he he really you know, created a structure that was his own. Okay, you're right. It wasn't Lions. It was Gabriel. Gabriel. I, I Gabriel. said that I knew that wasn't quite right. Lions was his other son. Yes, that's right. That makes gotcha. sense. Yeah. Yeah. So episodic plays. Um, you were in one that I directed that is one of my favorites, Cloud Nine. Okay. By Carol okay. Churchill, very episodic. The first act takes place in colonial Africa. The second act is 20 years later, as it says in the script, but happens right. in 1980s England. Mm -hmm. you know, so really kind of playing with time, playing with location. Uh, sometimes it means uh, also that actors play more than one character, usually in a climactic traditional plot uh actors play one character um in episodic work and and again this is not a hard and fast rule but these are tendencies often in episodic works there might be many many characters and so you might have an actor who plays several characters like think about angels in america very yes, episodic. that's very episodic so, yeah yeah 
Yeah. Okay. And we've got a diagram of episodic, which is kind of just uh, sketchy because you might have the, the implication here is that you might have many moments of rising action and falling action and climactic moments. Hmm. Um, and then people, this is, this is really interesting. If you go back and read about uh, the time when episodic structure began to be more popular, I suppose this writing is maybe in the seventies. Um, Many people talk about climactic structure as being rather male in its form and episodic structure being rather female in its form. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't know if I agree with that necessarily. I think right. we, uh, we like to put labels and gender labels in particular on things that I don't, need them. don't need them. And I think it serves to kind of facilitate more stereotyping. Right. Um, but that's, you know, that's one of the ways that these two different structures have been discussed. Okay. And I've got some ideas about getting started. Um, I think it's really valuable to keep a journal. I, I keep notes about ideas in weird places. I keep them on my phone. I keep them in a journal. I sometimes send myself emails with notes. Uh, if something inspires you, even if it's it doesn't seem like it's necessarily related to a play that you might write or anything you might write, you might hold on to it because inspiration is it's really personal, you know, and it if something touches you, you don't know when you go back to it, what it might do to help you in a moment when you're, you don't know what to do in a particular plot that you're writing or you're stuck um, with a character or something like that. Reading plays is probably one of the best ways to learn how to write plays. Um, it Because the more plays you read, the more you will see how playwrights use dialogue. And, and I'm not suggesting that then you copy that work. Right. Although, although the, a good exercise, actually, if you love a playwright or any writer, you know, mimicry, not stealing their work, obviously, but trying to write like them is what some people do to start themselves off. Um, writing. I'm sorry, I just want, that's also a really good tip for anyone wanting to do screenwriting, because if you're ever wanting to get hired as a um, writer on a television show, essentially you're gonna be recreating the style of whoever wrote the pilot. Yep, now that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, just read a lot of plays, lots, and different types of plays, um, especially. Although I suppose if you're really interested in writing a particular, you know, type of structure, then look for those plays that follow that. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing you can do is create a detailed dis uh, character description. Just start creating characters and really make it detailed. Try to give, th give them as many different uh, descriptors and qualities to really flesh them out. So, you know, not just their age and, you know, kind of what they look like, but What's their background? Um, you know, who? What are their relationships? What what kind of work do they do? What did they want to be when they were a kid? What dream did they miss out on? Things like that that can really help you to imagine the character. The more you can imagine the character, the easier it's going to be to get that character to speak. Because if the character doesn't really have a whole lot of detail, then probably that character is going to sound similar to another character that doesn't have a lot of detail. The more detail you give them, the easier it's going to be. It's like our friends, you know, we know um, our good friends, we kind of know almost the kinds of things they're going to say. Right. Because we know them well enough that, that not that they're predictable, but we understand their character. Once right. you have a couple of, of characters that are really fleshed out for you, just start putting them together, getting them interacting. Sometimes writers talk about the fact that once you start 
You can't stop. <laughs> well, yeah, you can't stop because they start telling you what to say. Like it, right. it's a weird experience. It's almost like they take over. Uh, and, and it's, it's really fun. Uh, sometimes you can use your own experiences to inspire a scene. Uh, it depends on, you know, how much you want to share. And of course, some things probably we don't want to, but you, you know, you don't have to tell anyone that this is your experience. You can create characters and, you know, just maybe be careful if it's something that is really sensitive and someone else is involved, of course, but um, that can be a way to really not only inspire a scene, but then maybe, you know, it will become something larger because that serves as a jumping off point. Uh, I think that a lot of people are inspired by historical figures or stories and that you can adapt that uh, into a scene and just, you know, sort of play with the idea of a historical figure that you're really, you're really interested in speaking and, and how would they speak and what would they talk about. And, you know, this is where some research comes in or not. It, you know, it depends on how you're approaching it. Okay. Should we move on to the next one? And, you know, once you start writing, then you can start giving yourself goals. Um, maybe your goal is just to write a one minute play and they do exist. There's a really great book out there, um, a couple of them actually, that is from Too Much Light Makes the Baby Go Blind. It's the neo-futurists uh, from Chicago. There's actually, I think, a, another branch of them in New York City. And they do one minute plays and they write many of them a week so that in their performances, although I don't know that, I don't know what they're doing right now. <laughs> this particular time. I hope they're doing well. I've seen their work many, many times in Chicago and just love them. But these one minute plays, you might think, one minute play, what are you talking about? It does need to still, you know, have some kind of structure. It needs to have that beginning, that middle, that end. There's a story in there. You can write a one minute play. It's just a small idea. So maybe start writing one minute plays, write a series of one minute plays. Maybe there's a theme that you're really jazzed about right now, you know, write five plays around the same theme. Pretty soon you're sort of discovering your own rhythm as a writer. And then maybe you want to try a 10 minute play, um, which if you do, it's probably a good idea to outline it. Mostly because you, first of all, one of the things that happens with 10 minute plays is that you might think you're writing a 10 minute play, but the idea is bigger than a 10 minute play. Yes. And suddenly, you know, it's like, oh, I can't really contain this. But if, if your goal is to write a 10 minute play and there are lots of 10 minute play competitions out there actually, uh, or festivals. So, you know, these are really submittable. You probably want to think through the idea and outline it so that you know that you can contain it within about 10 pages or so, eight to 10 pages at most. And then maybe rewrite that in a different style, um, just to give yourself some practice at doing something that might be, you know, a little bit different. Probably the most important thing, though, if you're really starting to get into writing and wanting to do more and, and needing uh, feedback is to form a writer's group with some like-minded people and maybe not so like-minded people, just because it's good to get different perspectives. Meet with them regularly, share your work, make sure it's a supportive environment. Um, there are some really great resources out there for how to give feedback in a way that's helpful because yes, sometimes, yes. yeah, sometimes people just aren't helpful. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if a play is, uh, you might think about a play as a baby mm -hmm. know, and a playwright is birthing, you know, this baby. And so when people feel like they should be able to tell the playwright what to do with that baby, that might not be the right approach. Um, probably a good approach is to give the playwright information about what you experience, you know, what, what you um, learned, how you're seeing the characters, how you're understanding the action. And it's not that you can't give suggestions. You certainly give suggestions, but uh, I think it's always important to be a little careful 
about how much we try to tell people how, how they should do things. If mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, just to add on to what you just said, um, it, I, was, I learned in, in college this idea about giving feedback. It was a professor of mine and they said, it's not about whether it's good or bad, it's whether it's effective or ineffective. So when you're giving feedback, you know, it's, it's great to hear like what the playwright was maybe going for, what were their goals and whether they achieved them or not, not necessarily whether you like them or not, because yeah. everybody has different tastes. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and um, just a little shameless plug, the writer's room, which is the, the writer's group that is presenting this to you right now, we do daily challenges. And I've had a few people do one of the daily challenges and really get inspired from one of those and take that and go write something too. So um, if you want to join the writer's room, uh, the link will be in the description of this video. Yes, and you should. Durier is doing great work with writers. I'm, I'm very impressed and proud. Oh, that's sweet. It's true. Okay. These are just some resources. These are very few. Uh, you know, there are so many out there, but these are some of my favorites. Uh, one of the, one of my favorite books on this list is Playwriting and Process. I really like that particular book because Michael Wright uh, has all these etudes that basically are little exercises for um, maybe getting past writer's block or maybe developing a character further or finding a way to uh, create another layer of conflict uh, within a, a piece. And so that particular work, I think, is is just a really practical um, way to approach your process. Because I think sometimes we, we feel like, oh, I just need to write the play from beginning to end. And I need to use every single word that I've written. And it's all, you know, if I, if I don't, I'm wasting work. And that's, mm -hmm. that's not the way to think about it at all. Um, sometimes you've got to write a whole scene before you actually find the scene that you need to get to because of some small inspiration within the first scene that you wrote. Absolutely. And the rest of it might get thrown out. Absolutely. Well, maybe not thrown out. You hang on to it just in case, of course. But um, yeah, it's writing is such a, a difficult and layered process. Another of the books here that I want to point out is Spaces of Creation by Susan Zeter. Susan Zeter is a wonderful um, playwright. Uh, she writes plays for youth, and they're really imaginative and really innovative and fun, but also they can be very moving. And she's just a creative thinker. So anything that she says or does is worth paying attention to. And that's that. Um, thank you so much, Durier, for having me here. And I just hope that everyone will um, be inspired to write and stay writing and find people that they can work with. Um, I did have a few questions just to end these with before we leave. Um, one, I had a person ask, since Broadway was pushed back to 2021, um, what, what should people be doing to stay involved in writing and, and what, what should they do? Hold on, let me, let me ask the question the way they answered. Since the reopening of Broadway just got pushed back to 2021, um, what are creative ways to practice theater during COVID and how might that affect writing? That is a huge question. It's, it's Honestly, it's the question that we've been working on at my university. I'm in a theater concentration within the performing arts department. And so, the first production of our um, academic year just happened and it was called Love 1918. And the director, Carrie Seymour, decided to do a devised piece about the 1918 pandemic and make connections to the current pandemic with students. So the students largely wrote the piece, researched the piece, and um, you know, so that's one way. Then it was filmed not together. Everybody sort of filmed separately and it was uh, edited together and then streamed. In fact, I think tomorrow might be the last performance streaming um, through the Brooks Center uh, at Clemson University. 
uh, the Clemson players are the producing organization. So that's one way. Right now, I am in a I'm in a production of the Laramie Project. I'm just playing a couple of characters. Um, uh, another director at Clemson, Shannon Robert, is directing that. Some of that will be filmed outside with physical distancing. Some of it will be filmed through Zoom. Some of it will be filmed inside with physical distancing as well in spaces that are safe to do that. And then that will be edited together. I attended a performance uh, at the Warehouse Theater, not at the Warehouse Theater, a Zoom performance produced by the Warehouse, by the Warehouse Theater. Theater. Right. Yeah, um, which is in Greenville a couple weeks ago. And that performance was specific to a Zoom format and it was really an innovative, uh, fun, it was like we were all on a Zoom call purposely um, to learn about how to um, organize our lives, kind of Marie Kondo-ish. Okay. But then one of the participants was an actor and nobody else, nobody knew that, but then that person started to interact with the um, seminar leader. And it was a really, it was a really lovely performance. So, you know, people are doing lots of different things. I know some people are doing theater outside. Um, I would say it's really heartbreaking, of course, that we can't be doing theater in, in, in right, the way it should be done or could. However, yeah, I agree. However, I do think that Zoom, there are things to learn. There are things to be learned from this format. Um, one of the things that I think is really valuable is maybe connecting to what's happening right now. Maybe there's some writing that um, people can do that actually maybe helps them to manage what's happening right now. Um, because writing, you know, even though we may not think of it as therapeutic, I think it is. Um, yes, I agree. A therapeutic thing. But I think thinking outside of the box, you know, finding a way to safely present your ideas, thinking outside of the box, not assuming that we have to do things the way we always do. Right. I really think that we should be doing that all the time, not just now. I do think that too. I think this is a great opportunity for people to figure things out and just try new things. Yeah. Um, we actually have a, a user question, Becky. Um, the question is, I personally struggle with constantly editing myself while I'm writing. Do you have any tips for people whose inner perfectionist gets in the way of their creative acts specifically while writing? Well, I think that um, you kind of have to discipline yourself a little bit. And, and, you know, what that means to me is that I just have to spew it out. <laughs> like I just have to get it out. And so one way to do that might be to say, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to write for 30 minutes and I'm not going to go back and do any looking at what I just did. I'm just going to get it out, out on the page. And then I'm going to give myself an opportunity to go back and look at it, but not until tomorrow or, or whatever, you know, maybe setting up parameters for yourself. Maybe it's only five minutes. You write for five minutes. And then you give yourself a break. Then you may be right for another five minutes. Right, right. And don't go back to it right away. Um, but I, I do think that that is just part of learning to love yourself as a writer. Um, and, and I'm not saying that you don't already in some way, but I think we're just so hard on ourselves. It stops us. I mean, that's definitely the reason we're doing this group, because when you honestly, some stuff I've written and be like, oh, this is trash. Somebody else really. Like, oh, my God, it's amazing. And I'll take a second look at it. And I'm like, oh, it's not that bad. It's not what I thought it was. It's definitely just like an overly critical thing. And I think all writers deal with that. I really do. Even Stephen King probably deals with that. Oh, yeah, I'm sure he does. Um, <laughs> or used to. Maybe not. Maybe you never know. I like to think that people still deal with it just because it makes me feel better about myself. I actually but, they do. I think they do. I, I just, this is a little off topic, but I, I just am using a different, a new directing book for the directing class I'm teaching. And it was so heartening to read about this professional director who says in this book, every time I start a new process, I'm terrified. Yeah. I've, I've forgotten what I, what I'm doing. I, you know, and it just was like, oh, that's so good to know because I feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, our next question, it says, 
Um, how, how how about telling a story that you to tell? Because you said that earlier in the um, in the presentation, and I think I know what you mean. Because um, I recently had someone who wanted to write a story, but the two main characters were black, and they were like, "I really want to tell the story, and I want these characters to be African American, but I don't I don't want to be misrepresenting." So so what does a writer do when they're in a situation like that, or what could be ways that they could tell that story and it have it the truth that it needs to have. Sure. I, you know, I, I'm never one to really feel comfortable saying that it can't be done. And certainly we have examples of people who have written really like men who've written really strong female characters, women who've written really strong male characters, white people who've written strong African-American characters, African-Americans who've written. And of course, um, you know, it's different depending on the direction you're going. But I do think that in order to really tell a story that isn't yours, first of all, I think you need to really, really think about it first. <laughs> why? Seriously, right. I do. Why? I get why, you, yeah. Why, do I, why is this the story that I want to tell? Um, you know, is there is there a story that I could be telling, but I'm afraid to tell it, even though it's more my story? I just, I just think mm. it's good to think about that. Um, but then if it's like, no, this story really needs to be told, then I think there are some ways um, to do that. But I think it's through collaboration. Um, I, I really believe that then surrounding yourself, working with maybe even finding a co-writer, if you can, if you can make that situation work with someone who has, who is, who is, part of that perspective, whatever that story is, I think you're going to be able to tell a more honest story if you have someone, because research is good, but, you know, there was a time when anthropologists thought that they could just research about people and understand them. And that was really dangerous <laughs> because, you know, when you're looking at some group's ritual from the outside, it looks very different from, you know, imagine, I like to use this example, imagine some culture coming into, uh, let's say, for example, a Christian church and seeing um, communion. And they're saying, oh, we're going to eat the blood and drink or eat the body right, right. And blood. And they don't understand the context of that. I mean, you, it's really, really hard to capture someone's story just by researching it. Yeah, just from the outside too. So, right. you know, finding finding a way to collaborate, I think, is helpful. Okay, we got two more. Um, you talked about showing versus telling, but you specifically said that in dialogue, it's 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 if if you're writing a dialogue heavy piece, um, do you have any examples of how in dialogue specifically you could show versus tell? Well, instead of uh, saying, you know, so and so said this, like let let's say you're having a. a argument about something instead of saying talking about the argument just show the argument does that make sense yes um and, uh, it, yes and yeah I get, I get it absolutely instead of after the fact we're talking about this happened and it's actually interesting as an actor they always say when you do monologues don't do a monologue where you're telling a story because that's not as interesting as um you doing where you just do something so i get it that makes a lot of sense yeah yeah. Okay. And the last question, basically, when you're writing in plays, a lot of actors, directors, they don't really focus on the stage direction. Mm. They really ignore it um, for reasons that if you act or direct, you understand why. Um, so as a writer, especially in plays, how important is stage direction for the play versus, because the first production, generally, a lot of times the, the stage direction written for the first production gets published. So where's that in line for a writer? How necessary or unnecessary is it? It's a really good question. Um, I think that, you know, it depends partly on you as a playwright. So if you, if you want the person who is going to direct or act in the piece to understand your perspective on it, it's probably important to put in at least minimal stage directions so that you know, a moment isn't thrown away. Like sometimes language doesn't give us everything, right? And and thank goodness, because in life, 
when we speak, there's always this massive subtext, but sometimes on the page, we might not see the subtext as being clear. So if you need a moment to be clear because of what you're hoping your play to do, like what goals you have for that, that piece, that journey, then I think it's really important for you to put some stage directions in. I also think it's really helpful to not overdo it. Um, you know, they're, they're, the classic example of overdoing uh, stage directions is, um, oh gosh, what's his name? He wrote Pygmalion. Um, I thought you were gonna say Tennessee Williams. Well, Tennessee Williams also wrote a lot of stage directions, but the bigger example is, and his name is just not coming to I'll me. I'll see if I can find it. Um, but he wrote pages and pages of stage directions, and it's just, it's overbearing, <laughs> frankly. But then um, there are some players. George Bernard Shaw. Thank you, Shaw. Yeah, I don't know why I couldn't come up with that. Age, I guess. I don't know. It just happens when you're on the spot, too, when you need to know it. This is not there. Yeah. Uh, it does. Um, more now than it used to. But um, <laughs> then there are some people who just, they write none. And, you know, and if, if some playwrights say, I'm putting this out here and whatever happens to it is fine. But there are playwrights, and I know some playwrights who they really want to make sure that their message is clear. And if you really want, especially a particular moment, to be very much, this is what that moment is, then you really need some stage directions to help your director. Um, and directors do pay attention to them. Some of them don't, of course, but if you're, if you're a director worth your salt, you're going to pay some attention to those. <laughs> uh-huh. Right, <laughs> right. Pay attention to those because you want to understand where the playwright was coming from in order to really tell the story that they are giving you to tell. So. Mm. Well, that's all the questions that I have. And I just wanted to say thank you. That was super helpful and insightful. Um, this will be up. Um, if you're watching in the group, this will be up on the Facebook page and I'll repost the video in the group. Um, so everyone, round of applause for Dr. Becky Becker of Clemson University. Thank you so much for being here. If you haven't done it already and you're watching on YouTube, join the writer's room. Go to Facebook, type in The Writer's Room. I believe we're the only group with that name. You'll find us. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is Woe Nelly Media. Um, come back in the future for other events similar to this. Later next week, we are doing a live uh, screenwriting reading. We're reading a screenplay by a, sc uh, by a writer. I want to say his name, but I don't remember his name. So that's my fault. But I will see you all next time. And I hope y'all have a wonderful day. Oh, maybe not. Here we go.